Hey, old dogs. I just want to take a moment to welcome a new sponsor to the show, Smart Move. Smart Move is the best way I know to protect yourself from evictions and bad tenants. Smart Move has a special offer just for old dog listeners. Just go to tenantscreening.com, enter code OLDDOG25 at checkout, and you'll get 25% off your next screening. That's tenantscreening.com, enter OLDDOG25, and get 25% off your next screening. This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money. One man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon. Viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch, real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dog, spelled D A W G, find our podcast, and subscribe. We have a great show ahead for you today. Uh, this is uh, going to be a very interesting conversation. We're going to be talking about a couple of areas that we really haven't spent a lot of time in. Our guest is Frank Rolf, and Frank Rolf has been an investor in mobile home parks for almost 30 years and has owned and operated hundreds of mobile home parks during that time. He is currently ranked with his partner, Dave Reynolds, as the fifth largest mobile home park owner in the U.S., with over 250 communities spread out over 25 states. Uh, Frank, along the way, Frank began writing about the industry and his books, coupled with those of partner Dave Reynolds, evolved into a course and boot camp on mobile home park investing that has become the leader in this niche of commercial real estate. Uh, Frank also has a background in real estate investing in billboards, which is an area we've never talked about on this show. So we're going to be uh, addressing both and I'm um, really looking forward to it. Frank, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Thank you, Bill. I'm very excited to be here. Well, this is great. You've got uh, just a, a great background and you've been in the real estate arena for a long time. So, uh, you know, our, our um, <laughs> so look, I'm already doing some old dog barking here, ar, ar, ar. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, you know, I'd just like you to just kind of give a little background on your history and, uh, you know, how you kind of even came into this, uh, into the real estate realm here. Sure. Well, in b- both cases, mobile home parks, both happened by accident. So, uh, what happened on the billboards was I went to Stanford university out in California back in the days before you could buy your admission there. <laughs> and I was going to go to, yeah, and I was going to go to, uh, get an MBA and back in, back in the day, back in the, uh, late seventies, early eighties, any good business, uh, after school application to Stanford, Harvard, somewhere like that would be where you would start a business and then you would write about what it was like. And, uh, that, that was, that would help, help you out, give you a leg up on admission. And I graduated a year ahead of my class. I got out in three years. Wow. So I had one year to start a business and then sell it and then write a glowing item for my application. But I had to have a business to start, right? And coming out of 
Stanford, I knew nothing about business. So I asked various parents of people I knew, what would you start? What would be like a one-year pop-up business you could start and get rid of? And a lot of the answers were really stupid. Some people said, well, you should open a Subway sandwich franchise because they're only $10,000. Then I was like, yeah, but you can't just open it up and shut it down. You have to sign a lease. And But then one parent said, you know what? I think I would look into this thing called billboards. You know, it's it's weird. No one does it. And I guess you could like build a couple and sell them. And I thought, well, okay, that that's different. That's, that's attention getting. I'll do billboards. So I knew nothing about billboards. I called some other billboard companies and got a little little information because they thought I was just a lunatic. And uh, then I went out trying to find a billboard location to build, and I failed miserably. And after nine months, I didn't have a single thing to show for it, which means I would have nothing good for my application. And then suddenly I lucked out. I went to a meeting with the guy about building a billboard on his property, and he felt sorry for me. And he said, you know what, uh, you obviously don't know what you're doing, but you, you seem to need this way worse than the other billboard companies that have called me. So I'll go ahead and sign up with you. What the heck? So I lucked out. And from that one guy, he convinced his neighbor. So then I had two. And then he convinced his dad. And so I had three just from this one connect, one random connection. So the problem is I've now burned through 10 months. And I have no billboards, so I say, well, I'll go ahead and build these and run them, and I'll wait another year to apply. So at the end of the second year, you can guess what happened. By then, I had, that was, up, I think, to 10 billboards, and I thought, well, I'll just go one more year. Well, I, I kept saying I'll go one more year until business school was never going to happen. And over 14 years, I built my way up to being the largest private owner of billboards in Dallas-Fort Worth. So I had about three, three, three hundred billboards, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, uh, it just, just not even really know what I was doing. Just uh, was very aggressive. I worked, you know, seven days a week, and and I uh, was in the right place at the right time. And uh, you know, at any rate, so that that was that career. Then what happened was here I was minding my own business, and at this point, I'd actually built a little office building thing underneath the billboard I owned on some land I own. And I get a random call from a guy that I had met once, just an acquaintance, who had just gone public with his company called Universal Outdoor. Uh, his name was Dan Simon. He just called me up and said, hey, I just went public, and, I, and I'm and i trying to buy, buy, buy. And I met you once at an industry event. And as I recall, you had a bunch of signs in Dallas, and you want to sell. And I threw out a price that to me made no sense to which he said, I'll take it. <laughs> and that was the end. That was the end of my billboard career. So it ended just as randomly as it began. Wow. So then the problem was, what, what, what do you do then? Right. So I sold <laughs> off the billboard empire and, uh, I needed to find something to do. So I did the same thing I did on the billboard. I started calling people, but this time I started calling all my own, my old billboard landowners, of which I had about 300 in every kind of business from, uh, topless bars to farming, and I would call them up and say, tell me about your business, because I was curious about getting into it. Well, one of the first ones I called was a guy that owned a mobile home park called Ron that I had built two billboards on, and Ron tells me, you know what? If you want to know what my business is all about, just buy it from me right now on the phone. And I said, well, Ron, I know nothing about you. Ah, you can figure it out. Come on. You can do it. So I'll make you an unbelievable deal. Three hundred, No, $400,000, $10,000 down, and I'll carry 390000 for 30 years. Wow. So How many spaces said, was it? 83 spaces. So I said, Ron, if you are this aggressively going to sell me this on the phone, I know it's losing money, right? <laughs> And he goes, yeah, it is losing money. So how much are you losing, Ron? He said, I'm losing 2000 a month. So I thought to myself, you know what? If I buy this, I'll be out $10,000 if I give it back. Plus, you know, I'll probably spend three months trying to fix the problem. So there's another 6000 So what the heck? I'll just go ahead and buy it. It'll be a heck of an education. It might even go somewhere. And that's how my mobile home park career began with that one little park. And because I didn't know anything about parks at all, to give it my best shot of success, I actually started officing directly out of the park, a little single wide trailer. So I sat out there in the mobile home park every day from nine to five for a year, learning the business. And that's that's how I got into it. So I, 
I was just, just as, again, just as absolutely a random thing. My stereotype of mobile home parks could not have been more negative. I thought they were nothing but chalk filled of misfits and, and criminals. And so the very first thing I did when I agreed to buy it was I ran down and got a concealed handgun license in Texas <laughs> because I didn't dare show up without a pistol in my pocket. <laughs> and basically, I learned that every stereotype I had was all wrong. My knowledge as an American of the industry was completely wrong. And uh, but that that began my odyssey in the park business. Fascinating! Wow. And uh, you you were so you were also managing it. I, I assume if you moved in there into the trailer, you just yeah. Let, let, let's make it accurate. I didn't move in. In other words, what I did oh, was okay. I, 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 lived, I lived in a house in a nice neighborhood in Dallas. Oh, okay. I would drive over to the park every day at about nine in the morning, and I would sit in a little single wide learning the business, kind of self-managing, and then I would leave at five. Now, I had an assistant named Stephanie, mm-hmm. and she lived in the park. So every day, first question was, Stephanie, what happened overnight, right? Or on Monday, what happened over the weekend? So I wasn't I wasn't flying the plane truly solo. I had a co-pilot, mm. but it was my business, my money. So it was just me, but she she was there to help me. Okay, got it. So so you were kind of training her up to be the the manager of the park uh, in in that process. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. After after the first year, when I kind of understood how things worked, I was able to be more passive and have her manage. But for that first first year, not knowing a darn thing, knowing I was coming out of the shoot two thousand in the hole every month, I, I I needed to be a little more hands on. And and do you remember any of the numbers uh, you know coming? I know you mentioned you're losing two thousand a month, but uh, you know what uh, what you did to it and what you put into it. Oh, vividly, I vi- vividly remember it. Uh, first thing I did when Ron sent me his P and L. I scoured it to find out things that I could cut immediately that were not nailed down. And I noticed the solution right off the bat on the very first look, 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 see at his P&L. He had a cable expense on there of a, over $2,000 a month, oh, t- like 2400 a month. There's your loss. So right I there. Thought, <laughs> yeah. So I thought, what the heck? So I called the cable company and said, what is this? And they said, oh, Ron, uh, to be a nice guy, he's providing free cable to everyone in the park. And I said, well, but wait, I'm paying 40 bucks a month in my house for cable, right? Because this is back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And the guy said, yeah. And I said, well, if I'm, if I'm buying 83 times cable, shouldn't I get a discount? And he's like, well, Ron never asked for discount. I said, yeah, but Ron was a nice guy. He was losing money. This, I can't do this. <laughs> and then the guy's like, well, I don't know if we can really get that you know, pushed through. I said, what does this thing end? And he goes, well, it's already on month to month. So I said, so you said, I can cancel you right now. Yeah, well, then cancel it. The guy was like, you can't do that to your tenants. I said, yeah, I can. Because you know what else? I said, this park is half empty. So I'm not paying 40 a month per lot. I'm paying $80 a month per actually occupied oh, you, lot. So you're paying for <laughs> places, spaces that nobody was occupying. Well, nobody oh. was there, exactly. So I just I shut, I shut, I shut the cable off. I had a little pushback. I had a few people who said, hey, where's my cable? And I said, well, we're not providing it free anymore, but you can get Dish TV or Direct TV or you can connect yourself. But I, I then in one whack cured the negative. But then that wasn't the whole problem was because not only did I cure the negative, but I had now I have to pay Ron, right? I still have to pay the mortgage. I've got a $390,000 note. At, I think it was like at 5% or something. So I'm still a couple thousand in the hole. So the next issue is, what are the lot rents? The lot rents in this park were $175, I think, at that time. And the market lot rent in that market, it, it, in those days, today it's about 550 to 600 But back then it was probably half that, probably $300. So issue number two is I got to raise the rent. So I shut off the cable and I raised the rent. And then I said about it, reoccupying all the vacant homes yet massive number of vacant homes in there. So I started rehabbing and reoccupying those and lickety split. The thing was at break even. Now it's making a positive. And then I got my one big lucky break. I guess all these stories, you have to have your big lucky break. Right. My big lucky break occurred probably in the second year when they shut a park down in Dallas for redevelopment to build like a Home Depot. And my mother saw the article in the paper. She said, hey, you might be able to get a customer out of this deal. So I went down to the park owner and said, hey, 
I've got my park over here in South Dallas, and you're also kind of in South Dallas, and I'm, I'm wondering, do you have anyone you can spare? And the guy said, oh, my God, you, you, you are just what I was waiting for because I need to go ahead and get these people out of here. That was my agreement with Home Depot is I would get everybody out of here. So I'll move the people. I'll even pay to move them. How many can you take? I said, well, I'm half empty. I can take 30-something. He said, man, have at it. So I repopulated half the park with what were predominantly Hispanic families. And that then set in motion in a complete change to the property. My property had been pretty much filled with, with folks I can only describe as misfits. I had carnival workers. I had just the worst tenant base of all time. Mm-hmm. Now I, am, I import into, into the property uh, nice people with pride of ownership that want to have a nice place to live and want their kids to be proud to live there. And I have an immediate culture shock with my existing tenant base. So uh, in the end of the battle, all my misfits left, and I then repopulated the park with nothing but nice people. And that was, and then Gladhaven was basically a, a done project. That's the story of that property. Man, so in a couple of years, you were up, and it was profitable, and uh, and it must have been doing well enough that you thought, gee, you know, I want I want to keep pursuing this area. Um, what 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 sort of spurred you on to acquire other mobile home parks? Well, what happened then was, since I had unlocked the mystery of how mobile home parks work, and I'd found this strange thing I'd never heard of before called seller financing which I was just totally intrigued with, did not exist in the world of billboards. All, but all billboards was bank financing. Mm-hmm. I thought, well, if I can buy other broken mobile home parks with seller carry and fix them, that's, that's my business model. So I spread the word among local brokers, and I hit up other park owners, and next thing you know, uh, pops deal number two, $65,000. $5,000 down gets me 17 mobile home lots in a brick Three bedroom, two bath house. Gee whiz! Also in the Dallas area or a, a metro area? Yes, this was no. This was in Lake Worth, which okay. is Dallas Fort Worth, just north of Fort Worth. And it, and I just kept going with that model, and uh, all worked my way all the way up to uh, my first five parts were nothing but insanely cheap, damaged goods with seller financing that I then fixed. Did you also have the same sort of challenge in terms of your tenants um, on these other parks? Yes, for the most part, what, what happens is a lot of these bombs and pop, at some point in the movie, they lose all energy in the business. They just, they just stop. They just literally abandon the controls of the airplane. And when you walk off the controls of the airplane at the mobile home park, what happens is you start importing really, really bad tenants typically. So you start getting people that can't get in anywhere else because a lot of these bombs and pops, they didn't even do background checks. They didn't do any criminal screening, credit screening, word then passes mouth to mouth from people who can't pass criminal or credit screening. They tell all their friends. And then next thing you know, your park is a mess. Mm. The uh, park I bought in Oklahoma, as an example, I bought this park at a very well-known major thoroughfare in Oklahoma City, but no one would touch the park. The park had just the worst reputation known to man. And so when I first show up at the park to walk it, I have people living in all kinds of contraptions that are not allowed by law to be lived in. I have people living in school buses, oh, and I had geez. a family of four. I had a family of four living in a wow. pop-up, uh, one of those pop-up camper things off of a pickup truck. Oh, wow. no bathroom, no bathroom, no power, nothing. Mm. And I asked the, fa- the, the 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 family was there. I asked the uh, the wife, "How do you how do you go to the bathroom?" And she said, "Well, we go down to the McDonald's." And I said, well, how do you bathe at the McDonald's? Oh, gee. I mean, it was unbelievable. Oh, and, man. And so, yes, yeah, so a, lot, a lot of what happened, see, that, that property today you wouldn't recognize. Today it's all mostly newer, single wides, nice cars, carports, landscaping. But, you know, if you, if you just walk off and abandon your business, you, you just end up with that kind of stuff. And so when we turn these things around, oftentimes we're just basically bringing them back to life, you know, bringing rules back in. You know, good, good residents love it, bad residents leave and are replaced with, with uh, good people that want to live there. So but that's, that's basically been my, my, my niche in life is, is basically buying bad mobile home parks and bringing them back to life. 
Wow. Oh, you mentioned Oklahoma and mobile home parks. Uh, okay, my first vision is tornadoes. Why? I don't know why. Okay, but I mean, you always see the pictures, right? Uh, and it's always mobile home parks that, are, that get hit the hardest, you know, um, Tornado Alley right there in, in Oklahoma. Well, but you know, let me, let me tell you, because it's interesting you should say that, because you're exactly correct. I mean, Oklahoma, the line between Oklahoma City and Tulsa is the number one spot in America for a, a tornado. So that is definitely Tornado Alley. Wow. But I was there in the Great Moore Tornado, which we're all familiar with, which literally took and wiped out the city of Moore, Oklahoma. Wow. And wow. the interesting ending was, you know, took out stick build after stick build home, but my mobile home park was untouched. No way. <laughs> yeah. When, when, when you have a, you know, a tornado, tornadic winds will take anything out. Home Depot, hospital. I mean, the tornado in Joplin proved that. Yes. But it's also a little bit of random luck. So, you know, m- m- mobile homes, yes, they're not masonry construction. So they're, they're you know, not going to hold up as well with a direct wind event. But, but a lot of that in the world of tornadoes is just luck. Wow. Evicting a tenant can be painful and cost as much as 10000 in court and legal fees. The best way to protect yourself from evictions and bad tenants is to screen your tenants. And the best way that I know to screen your tenants is smart move. Smart Move is part of TransUnion, a trusted consumer reporting agency with more than four decades of experience. They built an online screening service for independent landlords that delivers critical credit and background reports to you in minutes. It is a valuable tool to help you when you are trying to decide who to put into your rental property, and they can help you find your next great tenant. Only Smart Move has a credit score built specifically for rental screening called Resident Score, which can identify eviction risk 15% better than a traditional score. With the Smart Move report, you'll also get a criminal background check, eviction history report, as well as a full credit report. And only Smart Move has Income Insights, a report enabling you to analyze renter income to determine if further verification is needed. See why 9 out of 10 users recommend Smart Move, and more than 4 million landlords have used Smart Move to make better leasing decisions. Smart Move has a special offer just for old dog listeners. Go to tenantscreening.com, enter code OLDDOG25, and you'll get 25% off your next screening. That's tenantscreening.com. Use code OLDDOG25 at checkout for 25% off your next screening. Smart Move. Reduce your risk of non-payment and eviction. I'm somewhat familiar with uh, mobile home uh, parks and, uh, you know, here in California, they, you know, they, they still have some and, uh, and they're active, but most of the community seems to be, um, seniors. And, um, did you, you know, shift any of the positioning on, on your mobile home parks and maybe targeting seniors? Cause they seem like they'd be great. You know, they're fixed income. They, they seem like they'd be great tenants. Yeah, see, the, the the problem with the senior housing is to, to truly be senior housing, you have to get the senior designation through HUD. Okay. And once you once you obtain that, you can never go backwards. So in other words, you're you're senior forever. Ah. And okay. we like to keep all options open because there's a lot of mobile home parks out there with a lot of vacancy, and they're vacant because they have the senior designation, but for whatever reason, they're no longer attracted to seniors. Right? They have a waiting list of families that want to move in, but they can't because of the designation. So what most park owners want to do is they, I mean, obviously we, we love senior residents, but we don't like to do the, the, the all or nothing commitment. Sure. So that way your park can be senior. It can segue over time to family. Then it can segue back to, to senior again. Right. So. Got it. God, I wasn't aware of that. Ah, okay. Well, um, this is real interesting, and, I, and again, I am going to probably ask some questions too about billboards more as we go along. But uh, still, sure. on, uh, as we're on mobile home parks, and uh, uh, what, what what really interests me is that you just jump in, you know, you, with both of them. You know, you, you've got an yep. office underneath a billboard. And it's hard to picture because I understand the real estate would be pr- pretty narrow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was a creative structure. That is true. Uh-huh. <laughs> so you, you're fitting it kind of under the the board there, and uh, but you jump in and you just just learn it. And I really I love that actually because I I think there's no better way to really to get an education. Sure. You also probably encountered some some major mistakes that you did in in, in both accounts and billboards and and mobile home parks. What what would you say for each of those? What was sort of your biggest mistake that you learned from and and went on to uh, you know to uh, benefit from from the from that education? 
Sure. Well, my, my biggest single billboard mistake that almost gave me a heart attack was uh, during the great savings and loan crash in Dallas, Fort Worth, back in the late 80s, mm-hmm. I went on a wild buying spree because I realized there's a once in a lifetime, you can look at it two ways. You could get all depressed and curl up on a ball on the floor and cry, or you can see it as a, as a once in a lifetime buying opportunity. Mm-hmm. So uh, I had that figured out good. And what I did was I realized that every bank in Texas and Oklahoma was insolvent. They were all taken over by the FDIC. So I'd have to find a bank outside of Dallas Fort Worth, which were in Alabama, in Montgomery, Alabama, and I forged a deal with them in which they would finance any sign that I could find to buy for the value of the steel of scrap, which meant I had a budget of about 10000 bucks. So we had a great relationship together, and I became the most prolific buyer you ever saw of foreclosed billboards. I would go directly to the FDIC, and I would offer them 10000 cash right now, no, no, no diligence. And many of them would say, Okay, because I don't even like billboards. I don't understand them. I don't even want to learn about them here. I'll just sell to you. So as I as I kept buying up stuff, the bank got more confident in my abilities of being a master deal maker. So one day I come across an entire company that's for sale, and I think, well, this is this is indeed you know a great opportunity, but it came with a couple signs that were way outside my comfort zone. They were each priced at one hundred thousand dollars each. Oh, gee. And the reason they were so high was they rented for $5,000 a month per side. Hmm, yeah. See the dilemma Ouch. here? So I'm, t- I'm typically a $10,000, $20,000 buyer, but to unlock this guy's portfolio, which had 25 signs, I'd have to stick my neck out on two of them to the tune of 100000 each. Way, way beyond my comfort zone. Right. Job. The bank was telling me, oh, you can do it. You're a master at this stuff. This is a cakewalk for you. Don't worry about it. It's all going to be just fine and dandy. <laughs> well, it, it wasn't. What happened was my landlord was the railroad because they're, they're a lot of, the number one largest landowner of billboards in America is, in fact, the railroad. Really? That's fascinating. And, yeah. And, and railroad leases are only 24 hours in, in length. They're crazy. They're a, it's a one-day lease. And every 24 hours, they automatically renew for one more day. And that's how they've been since the 40s. So I couldn't change the lease, couldn't get more time on it. <laughs> so I went to the railroad and said, hey, railroad, now you're never going to develop the land where those signs are, right? And they said, oh, gosh, no, we'd never develop that. We've owned that land for 100 years. It's of no value to anyone, just, uh, just for us, it's the railroad. Well, those were famous last words. I bought both signs, and within... Probably six months, I get a letter notifying me they're canceling both of my leases effective immediately <laughs> and, and to please get the signs off the property. <laughs> I ended up selling each of the signs for about $15,000 a scrap, which left me about $170,000 in oh, the hole. Man. And even though it didn't, I never got over it. Oh, man. So my the thing I learned from that is that don't don't get don't get involved in things that you can't handle the worst case scenario. Wow. So and and I and I knew it at the time when I bought them. I knew I was violating that simple principle on life. And man, did it ever come back to haunt me. And that bank had been so positive about it was all over me within mere seconds. How could you have let this happen? Oh my God! What are you going to do? We, you got to replace these signs immediately, or we're going to call your loan due <laughs> because you're violating our collateral provision. Oh, it was just crazy. Geez. So it was, my, it was my fault. I had gotten I got a little too uh, too bullish, and I got caught in that trap. So that was my key billboard lesson learned. On the uh, mobile home park side, it was probably a different lesson. On the mobile home park, I came very close at one time to giving Glenhaven back because it was had master metered gas Ooh. and I lost my gas in the dead of winter. So I had no heat. I had no way to cook and I had no hot water to any of my residents. Oh, gee. And I was literally flustered beyond belief. And I thought, you know what? I can't deal with this. I will have uh, a nervous breakdown. So I was so close to calling Ron and saying, Ron, I'm just giving it back. You know, I had a non-recourse note. So all I would have been out was my down payment and any other money I'd put in. And uh, but fortunately, I didn't pull the trigger. I calmed myself down, pondered it, thought, how do I work through this and kept it? 
And if I had given it back, it would have been a different story. I would have never had any any mobile home parks or never been fifth largest or anything. So on the mobile home park thing, it was the reverse. On the billboard thing, I got too cocky. On the mobile home park thing, I got a little too uncocky. How did you resolve that issue with the gas? Well, I, 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 worked, I worked through it. I looked at what the options were. I found there was the option to put in propane tanks. Oh, so what go. we did was we bought, we bought 83 pro t- propane tanks. The problem was they could only set two of them a day. Right. So so I would have no gas for 40 business days, two months of time. But unbelievably, we worked it out. We actually we we it was we I'm using we incorrectly. Stephanie, who was the lady that lived there, she had obviously been a cruise director in a former life. She was able to get the residents actually enjoying the fact they had no gas. She would hold a daily event, whose house is the coldest, and then all these outdoor <laughs> cooking things. And then as people got their gas, she would have people move in with each other till the next home was restored. And, and we never even made the media. Today, impossible. I would try to be on the news day one, but we survived it. But on that one, I guess the key lesson is you got to be a little more Sully Sullenberger, you know, when, when problem strikes, kind of just calm down and get the details and try and work it through because I, th- I think it was uh, Kaiser, the steel bag is whose old express saying was uh, problems are only opportunities and work clothes. Wow. Right. So that's kind of, that's kind of what I learned from that. Interesting. Wow. And, and conversely, what were, what were the things that you did uh, in both of those areas that uh, really ended up just being a home run for you um, on each side? Well, that's easy. On the billboards, it, my, my key takeaway from 14 years of being a billboard person was there's big money in volume of little pieces, right? You know, a lot of those billboards that people drive by on the highway, they think nothing about. I never did before I got in it. I never, I never even thought for five seconds about a billboard. But let's just take those little wooden billboards you see out there on the highways and byways of America, not on the interstate, but on those two-lane country roads. Those things typically make about two or three thousand dollars a year. So before you say, "Well, who do you want to screw with that?" You know, there's al- they're almost completely zero management required because you rent the ad space typically one time a year, mm-hmm. and it has no moving parts. So you put up the ad, and you don't even have to visit the site again for a year, and unless there's a storm that blows a panel off, it doesn't even matter. So they're they're very easy to control in large volume. If you have a hundred of those. Then you're making two or two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. It's kind of like those kiddie rides at the mall. People look at the kiddie ride at the mall and go, "Who would even jack with that? Mm-hmm. How much can you make? Thousand bucks? Well, yeah, but if you've got two thousand kiddie rides, then it's it's big money. So interesting. Uh, the the billboard business was was all about scale. It was like don't 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 listen to other people who think, oh yeah, well that's a stupid endeavor. What, what a waste of time. There's no money. They didn't know nothing about what they're talking about. A lot. There's there's a million businesses out there that it's all built on scale. Interesting. Um, so that, that 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 was a big positive on that. How many did you own it at the peak? Well, I own three. I own three hundred. Wow. Wow. Interesting. So I, I I I learned all about scale. I love it. On the uh, on the mobile home park side, probably the big takeaway on that was. Just in that one sector, the unique opportunity of buying things direct from mom and pop. Because when you buy from mom and pop, A, you can get really good deals because they're typically very unsophisticated on values. Plus, the businesses are typically not running on all eight cylinders. And then the other thing which really intrigued me was seller financing. And and even today, we're still doing seller financing. I mean, I I love seller financing. It's It's the most amazing concept of all time. You don't have to. You don't have to go to a bank. You don't have to do any bank applications. You don't have any of that terror, frustration of banking, uh, which to me is just is just the greatest thing ever invented. And I don't know any other industry you can do it in because to do it, you have to be buying from people who have no debt, right. and that means people who own it free and clear. And that's and that's there's very few sectors in real estate that I know of where people own things free and clear. Right. So that, that's what makes it unique. So they, and they must love it too, because now they've got the the income without the headaches, you know, that come with it, right? That's exactly correct. See, if you if I buy if I buy a part from someone for cash, he has to pay tax, and then he goes down to AG Edwards, and what do they get him on a 
Treasury today, 2%, mm -hmm. right? And if I if he seller carries, he only pays tax on the money as it's received. So he actually earns interest on what he would have paid in tax. And then I would pay him on the same transaction 5%. So they make about two and a half times more money by carrying. And then you might say, well, what about the value of the collateral? Well, okay, right. The treasury that is backed by the U.S. government, but then my deal is backed by the park that they built and owned and operated for all those years. So it's not like it's a non-secured deal. Right. So the really the bottom line is there really is no reason people would not carry, and that's why they carry so much. That's great. Yeah, the taxes that they would have to uh, incur from that purchase, yeah, it would uh, be something that'd be deferred indefinitely there as you're paying it off. Yeah, it's about a, about a, about a, yeah, it's about a, about a third is paid on in tax on the front end, if that third of the amount until that is ultimately repaid. So I mean, there, on paper, just based on sheer numbers, anyone would carry. Right. Right. The only the only pushback you get on carry often is people will say, well, you know, I'm 85 years old. I don't know how much longer I'll have to live. And so I don't really think I want to carry something for number one. You know, e even if they should pass away during the time of the mortgage, you know, it doesn't erase the asset. Now their heirs would still have the asset. They would still have a first lien note paying out whatever. So it's just it's no different than dying and leaving somebody, a, a, a you know, a, a bond or a something that's, that's income producing. So they, you have to look at it a little differently. Right. But, you know, some people, they just, they just won't carry, which, you know, I understand. But most people, most people, when they really look at it, they prefer to carry. Mm, that's great. That's great. Well, um, looking at, uh, you know, sort of, bo again, both, both areas here, uh, what, um, uh, what things, now you've 30 years in mobile home park business, you've got a lot of experience and I'm sure you've, you've been through a lot of different situations and scenarios. And, and I would think with that skill set that uh, you can look at a deal pretty early on, determine whether or not it's a good deal or a bad deal. Um, uh, what, what are sort of the, those key things that you, you know, you'll look at first off, you know, here's, here's a potential deal and, and sure. what are those deal killers that you might see in that process? You bet. Well, there, I mean, there, there's basically five things, that, that that make a deal worth buying or not. And if you if you put them together, they spell the word ideal, I-D-E-A-L. Uh, the I is for infrastructure. Uh, you know, we're, when we're buying a mobile home park, contrary to what people may think you watch TV, we're trying to buy what are more like high-density subdivisions. And we're wanting professional-styled, you know, city, water and sewer, paved roads, parking pads. And, you know, a lot of people think when they think trailer park from T, uh, the ne next item is density. The problem with density is the mobile home parks are, you know, they date, many date back to the 30s and 40s. And back in the olden days, they were only eight feet wide, and the longest one they ever built was 30 feet long. So sometimes those locations, uh, which worked so well back in 1945, today are obsolete because they don't make mobile homes that small anymore. So those have to be either become RV parks or if you want to make them into decent mobile home parks, you often have to give up two, three, even four lots per new space. So that's, that density is huge. The e is for economics. You know, the economics in the industry is pretty much the same. We're all trying to make about a 20% cash on cash return, which means you have to buy it at a cap rate that's a three point spread over the interest rate. So, but economics are key. Uh, this next one is really odd. People would say, what the heck? But it's, it's the age of the homes. It goes in two directions. Number one, you don't want the homes to be too old because those 1950s and 60s homes are no longer what customers want to live in. So when those homes go empty, it's really hard to remodel and sell them off because nobody wants to live in spaces that small anymore. The other end of the spectrum is you don't want them to all be too new either because new homes have mortgages and mortgages uh, get foreclosed on sometimes and it costs about $5,000 to move a mobile home. So mobile home people don't ever have that money, but a bank does, and a bank may pull your the home, pull the home out of your park in a foreclosure. So you want the stuff in the middle. The, the age of the homes you typically want is you want homes from the 80s, which have round roofs to them. It's what most people in America, when they think of mobile home, actually they're thinking of the 80s product, which looks like a loaf of bread, mm -hmm. all the way to the 90s, which has a, has a pitch roof. But, you, but what the big thing is you want modern floor plans that are paid for. So you don't want stuff that's too old 
or two new. And the final item, the L, is for location. Because again, all real estate is location, location, location. We all know that. There's basically two locations in parks that work. There's that gritty, urban, inner city thing that just like a lot of Americans prefer kind of gritty, urban, high-rise living today in most big cities, there's people who like that in, in mobile home parks too. They like to be able to be right in the heart of the action. They want to be able to walk to this and walk to that. And then the other style is more of the sub subdivision, more of the suburban feel, good school district stuff. But those, those are those are the five factors we look at on every deal. Now, what you're going to find when you look at them is, which is kind of unfair in life, is that there's no park in America that scores high in all five. If you take the, the, the number one parks in America based on lot room, which are mostly all out in Southern California, for example, there's a park down in Newport Beach, right on the ocean. It's it's uh, now it's not on the beach. There's it's separated from by a road, but it's right next to the road that's next to the beach. And although that park looks fantastic and the lot rents are about twenty five hundred a month, wow. the infrastructure is terrible. The infrastructure is, is it's all kinds of master metered power and gas and lift station and all and and that that is because they haven't allowed new parks to be built since the seventies. So if you have a killer location, you know you have a really old park. If you have a really old park, you know you have weak infrastructure and you have high density. So you had all plays together. So in other words, right. every other real estate sector, there is the perfect property, right? You can say, what's the perfect hotel in America? And I don't know what it is, but it might be the Plaza or it might be the Drake or something. And it's perfect because it scores perfect in every category. Parks don't have that. So all the time, like a human, we're looking at the good things, the weak things, and we're having to say, okay, as a collective whole, we want to buy it. But it, it's much harder to analyze them for that reason because they're all like people. They all have flaws. Hmm. And do you have a uh, sort of a an ideal when it comes to, say, park-owned manufactured homes versus your tenant owning them or sure. yeah and is that something yeah. you try to pursue in terms of maybe having you know higher percentage owned by the park versus the uh, tenant yeah the, the, the way it works is in our industry we, we of course are at the end of the day slaves to the lending industry right because when you buy a mobile home park unless you're seller financing it's all about bank debt so we, ha we have to bow down to whatever the banks want. And the banks want no park-owned homes. That's their dream. They don't want the park owner to own any of the homes in there. Really? And we don't really want to own them. Yeah, we, and we don't really want to own them anyway because th there's no money in it. They're, 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 they're hard, to, hard to fix up and re repair often. And, and, and all the money, all the true values in the lot rent, because the, you know, the lot rent is considered real property. The homes are considered personal property. So my real property, I can cap at a eight cap or seven cap, but my personal property I can't cap at all. Mm. So we'll, we'll actually, if we buy a park with a park owned home in it, where the park owned home rent is seven hundred a month, and the underlying lot rent has always been two fifty, we're going to internally alter that and make the lot rent three fifty, right? Because by doing that, I've increased the value of that space fifteen or twenty thousand mm. dollars. And by taking off $100 off of my home income, it hasn't impacted me at all. So that, that's what the whole industry does anymore is what we're all about having people owning their homes and putting all of our value in the rents. Got it. And yeah. now the only place you don't see that, down in the southeastern U.S., down in Mississippi and Louisiana, Alabama, and Georgia, they have insanely low lot rents. Often the lot rents tend to be 75 bucks a month. Gee whiz. And since there's no money in the lot rent, they put all their money in the homes because you can still rent the home down there for 700 a month. Mm -hmm. So there, they, they can't make a living selling the homes to the residents. But if you look at our typical park, let's just take any, any of our parks, for example, in Ohio. Our lot rents in Ohio were like $450 a month. So, and the homes only rent for, say, $750. And out of that $300 spread, I have to pay taxes and insurance, which is 50 And then I have to pay my repair and maintenance, which is going to be at least 100 right? So there's there's way more money in the land than there is in the, in the homes. But a lot of that whole home investment, it's very locationally driven because, because the money you make with the home is the spread between the home rent and the lot rent. Gotcha. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. 
We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.